Hey, Hello. Trent. <clears throat> you got me? Oh, there you go. How are you, my friend? Good, brother. How are you? Oh, no complaints. No complaints? No one listens anyway, mate? Well, why would they? <laughs> <laughs> Busy day? Yeah, we all have our moments in life and our challenges, and we've just got to get on with it, don't we? Oh, you can do, brother. It only makes you stronger. Sorry, I just turned this light on. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on in this Sovereignty Month. It's nice and exciting to have you here. Good to be here, mate. Great to be here. Yeah, so, of course, we've been talking about sovereignty and the Sovereign Purpose Plan and how important it is to be sovereign and take power over your life more than ever before. So, really, maybe just, um, obviously, people, a lot of people here know you already, but perhaps just share a little bit more about yourself, just to those, just type in the text chat for those of you who haven't come across Trent before. Just say me, if that's you, if you, this is like the first time you've heard Trent. If everyone knows him, we don't have to say too much. <laughs> oh, yeah, Fiona. Okay, yeah, okay. There's a few, I think there might be a few, Trent. So I maybe just much. share about yourself. Give me the background about yourself and say hi, introduce yourself to everyone. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Was, and thanks, everybody, for your participation tonight and for, for listening. Um, so Trent Chapman, a little bit around about myself and I guess what kind of leads us into talking about sovereignty. Um, country boy, grew up out in the bush. Uh, I've traveled a, a hell of a lot and I've had some pretty unique life experiences. From my travels, when I've traveled, I've always been trying to crack the code to, you know, international sovereignty, what sovereignty is all about. I've spent a large majority of my life uh, in regards to understanding the mind, understanding consciousness, understanding how to raise that consciousness. But what I'm sort of most passionate about and what, you know, my purpose is here is to be able to help people, you know, raise that consciousness and come out of some of the dark, uh, the dark times that we can have and some of those nastier moments, because I've had my fair share of those, like many people have. But uh, on a professional level, I've played in a, a few different fields. So mental health was a big part of my life for a long time. Uh, I've done a lot of public speaking, a lot of keynote speaking for all your mental health organizations in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I've built my own programs as well, too. A lot of my programs have been identified within Parliament. And my programs and my approach that everything which I do is trying to bring things back more into layman's terms for people to understand. I love to use analogies so people can relate to it because, you know, everybody's on a different level. So I sort of spend most of my time these days trying to bridge the gap to sovereignty for those that are entry level novices into sovereignty to someone like yourself, Warren, who's right up in here. And I try and bridge that gap for people to understand that. And uh, I do that through do a few different formats. But uh, very passionate around about helping people. I've done a lot of work in the cannabis space. I've got a couple of different companies that operate in the cannabis space. I truly believe that, you know, plant is the way that we need to move forward for healing, um, as well as education around that. So I create avenues for Australians to be able to access cannabis products uh, without having to go through the mainstream medical model. Um, I've created a few products specific for women um, around things to do with menstrual cycles and period pains and pain that never really had a, a natural solution. So for myself, I probably would say that I'm a bit of a, I, I don't just talk the talk, but I walk the walk and I like to walk with people. I don't like to walk in front of people or behind people, but I like to work in a, in a form of a tribe and like to elevate everybody around me. It's, um, I've had some unique experiences in life that, you know, traveling is obviously a huge one. Uh, I spent some time in prison about 18 years ago for things involved with cannabis, which I now do in a different format. I've learned from people and places that not many would have. Um, you know, even prison is a place where there's a lot of education in that space as well too, right? You get to understand law in a very different perspective. I've been a byproduct of the matrix for periods in my life, but uh, I can comfortably say about eight, nine years ago now, I sort of exited that space. And I'm a big believer. I'm a man of faith. I'm a big believer in believing in myself. I'm a big believer in believing in people around me in community. And really, I guess that's kind of what I try and bring out of, out of people is to help them find that belief, help them sort of mitigate any challenges they might have in natural solutions and uh, yeah, help really create paths for people to find their true sovereignty so we can give back to humanity 
so we can make the changes that we need to make. But uh, I really believe that, you know, sovereignty all starts in the mind and we need to get it right in the mind first and foremost before we can action anything else. So a few little things about me. I could talk all day about this. I've done many things, charity sort of stuff. Uh, I've walked from Brisbane to Sydney with a whippersnipper before. I've done a marathon a day for 28 days for mental health. Um, <laughs> I've rode posty bikes from Broome to Darwin uh, for mental health. There were 13 posty bikes on that one trip, but love doing stuff. I love doing the things that people say is impossible. And I like to help other people relate to that and help them do the things that they think might be impossible and show them that everything's possible once you've, you've got the right mindset. Absolutely. So interesting. So let's, where do we start with such a broad range of knowledge? Like really this month, as you know, is all about sovereignty and the age of the sovereign individual. That's something that was spoken about by Rees Moggs and Davidson in 1995, how people would see the evils of, na of national centralized government or what we call the globalized cartel and mm -hmm. start wanting to break away into sovereign communities and individuals. And they did say there'd be a tumultuous time around this time when there was a kind of what's called a transition phase that we're in now before we move into it. So we're in a transition phase really where people can now see the, you know, what they're dealing with more and more and like realizing that the governments and the cartels don't necessarily have their best interests at heart. And so we're trying to like, how do we function in this world where they actually don't? And so of course, that's what inspired me to do this month around sovereignty. And especially with this kind of sense that with the U S election coming up, a lot's going to probably happen and more than ever i'm sure many people will wish trent that if they had a magic wand and they could go back in time that'd be more ready for covid most people have kind of caught them you know running out the back door with pants down so this time around just being a bit more prepared and realizing that nothing ever happens the same thing twice so if people are thinking government suddenly locked down and things like that i doubt that will happen i think it will be a whole different strategy so and i think a lot of it's around money and the economy which is what we're seeing right now Yep. So really, so one of the reasons I want to get you on was I know you run your Sovereign Purpose Plan to help people from the beginning get started. But would you be, think it's fair to say, being a mental health strategist, sovereignty specialist, but also around mental health with your background in parliament and all that, but sovereignty really starts in the mind and how you think. Is that a fair comment? Oh, absolutely, mate. Well, everything's mentalism at the end of the day, right? So everything's within the mind at the end of the day. But You've got to be able to have the ability to be sovereign in your own mind so that you can be sovereign within yourself, first and foremost, right? Because it's very easy for the, you know, the devil to appear in the mind. It's very easy to lose your flow and to lose your touch when you may need to act in a sovereign way. Because you're right, was like the matrix is very tight. It's very challenging. It's difficult, but you've got to be able to control yourself first and foremost. And, you know, the matrix really is just a psychological trauma bond. So for us to really be sovereign in the mind, we really need to be friends with our trauma or we need to work through our trauma because we can't have, you know, a central nervous system start to, to spark and start to peak when we might be in areas of confrontation or areas of a challenge because, you know, when you're really sovereign in the mind, then you can be sovereign in your heart then as well too, right? And really when you operate in sovereignty, it's really the energy that you put out because you want to be on a different vibration to, you know, the dense matrix vibration. And you've got to be able to live outside of those low chakras. You know, you've got to be able to live within your higher self. But absolutely, mate, it all starts in the mind. And yeah, again, we've got to be sovereign of ourselves first and foremost, right? We can't be victims to ourselves. So yeah, absolutely all starts in the mind was. Yes. So maybe just share a little bit more. Like, so how, I mean, it's a, it's an ongoing journey really. And I think one of the mistakes that one can make, and I've made many, many times is that you start to think enlightenment is a kind of, has got an end, an end game, you know, where you get to the end and you're enlightened and you realize you fit. And in fact, in the I Ching, one of the hexagrams, hexagram 63 is before completion and basically what it says. And then there's another one after completion, which says, we think the journey ends but it only just begins in another way. So yeah. the journey never really ends. It just keeps going. And so, you know, you clear one area of your life and then you've got another area and then you have something else come up. So really, how do you basically help people stay motivated around their mental health? And especially when we're living in an absolutely fuck. I mean, it's hard to really talk about how fucked up we're living in right now and the extent of the damage that's happened to people's, you know, 
way of thinking. And I know you often tell me about mental health as a product of the environment. Can yeah. you maybe share a little bit more around that and a strategy yeah. that people use? Oh, absolutely, mate. So, you know, first and foremost, yeah, there is some chaos out there, but only if you choose to look at the chaos, right? I think there's more opportunity than we've ever seen as well too out there. We absolutely are moving into the new world and we need to embrace that, especially in the sovereignty world. Like things like technology and AI, we can utilize our advantage, you know, in, in so many ways. But when we talk around about, you know, how we inspire and how we and how we can live that sovereign life is that we have to have purpose. And we have to have purpose, which is our true purpose to our authentic self. Because when we're living in purpose, we have direction. And more often than not, the mental health challenges come from not living with purpose. And then when we're not living with purpose, we're in environments that aren't really the environments that we desire to be around. So we can become byproducts of those environments as well. I think when you have purpose, Warren, you've got a nice clear vision and you know what you want to do, well, you know the route. And yeah, the goalposts are always going to move. And that's a beautiful thing because there is no finish line, right? There's just continual growth, continual experiences. But we must have purpose. We must have a path. And then when we've got our purpose, well, what I like to call, you know, spirit snipers, whether it be the matrix, people, things around us that can take our energy or get us off our path. When we know our path and we know where we're going, well, it's very easy to block out any distractions. It's very easy to remove ourselves from those environments because we very much are. Like, it's very dense out there at the moment and we very much are becoming byproducts of that environment. So, you know, the first thing that we can always do with our mental health is change our environment. And, you know, not only change our environment, but change our perspective as well too. We've, we've got to have that fire within us that we're living for something and that we're making a difference and we're contributing towards something. I think a big part of mental health challenges is, yeah, absolutely environment, but if we're not living with purpose, then of course we're going to run into mental health challenges because we're fighting amongst ourselves. We're not living by that moral compass. We're not living by that soul desire of what we want to do. And we're trapped in other areas fulfilling other people's visions or, or carrying out other parts. So yeah, mate, we, we, we have to have purpose. That's the most important thing. And then, you know, recruit people and have people around you find out, you know, the, the who, who can help deliver that purpose and how we can do that. But that absolutely takes us away. And, you know, another thing to, to be mindful of in our mental health space at the moment is we're aware that, you know, EMFs around us, we've got things going in the skies and all the rest of it. So you've got to just stick to your basics too, right? Like you've got to make sure you get your good sleep, you've got to make sure you got get your good rest as well, eating your good diet, all the basic stuff. But, you know, like anything, it comes down to responsibility, right? And we've got to take responsibility for ourselves. And uh, maybe I think purpose is, is, is the key for everybody, right? To find that purpose. If we're not living by purpose, we've got to find it. And that purpose can always change too, right? Yeah. Because things always change. And that's a great thing because, you know, we've got to do with purpose what we love and what we're good at, right? But those things change as we develop and as we evolve as well too. And we come into new environments also. So, it, um, mate, having purpose, clear purpose, having good people around us, and not being sucked into the distractions of the matrix. Because most of those, you know, mobile phones, huge problem for everyone. I know that's challenging, especially for parents with kids and things like that. There's so many modern day things where we just need to take responsibility, just remove those from our environment, mate, you know? Yeah. Very interesting, isn't it? I noticed that myself these days that as I've been getting, you know, often I find I'm on my phone a lot more than I used to be. And I'm just thinking, why is that? And again, you know, you feel what's going on around you. And when I finish work and I've unwound, you kind of like, before you know it, you want it playing games. If you're not careful, you're scrolling social media. And I've noticed if I'm playing games, less of an issue. If I'm scrolling social media, I can feel after a while it starts to affect my head because yeah, we, you're picking up the matrix, whereas games is just more like a bit of fun. So Absolutely, but you've got to remember too that you're getting your dopamine hit from everything too, right? So when you're behind that screen, that's what it's doing. It's giving us these dopamine hits. So that's what we're chasing. We're not really chasing the scroll or the game. It's the dopamine hits that people are looking for without really realising it. And, mate, you know, like it's pretty crafty. Like they've done this, they've played this game very, very, very well <laughs> where people are sucked into things not even realising that they're sucked into those things, right? But, you know, utilising, let's just stick with the screens for a moment and gaming and stuff. Like 
we haven't evolved around that space where we have something so bright in front of our pineal gland or in front of our eyes, you know, link into our pineal gland before we go to sleep. So quite often, you know, we're not rested either, right? And that's the number one, you know, most important thing is probably getting our sleep. And if we're not well rested, then how can we get through the day's challenges and how can we navigate? It's really difficult to put up a fight when you don't have any juice, right? You know, when you're exhausted. And I think that's a big thing which is happening now, mate. People are flogged, like they're exhausted. They're absolutely cooked. You know, we're not getting the right sleep. Um, we're not living with purpose. We're literally running on empty and trying our absolute best to get through it. We're not doing the things that bring us joy and purpose, right? So we've got to be so mindful, like little things, um, you know, even changing lights in your house to red lights is incredible. Like take the stimulation away from stimulating your skin so much, you know, use red lights to make it calmer. Bring the books back, you know, put the screens down. Just, it's always back to basics, like was it, right? And like always back to basics when we want to get in line. But again, that comes down to responsibility because no one can make anybody do that except for themselves. Yeah, it's tempting to jump online and see what everybody's doing throughout the day, but you've got to take that response and go, no, 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 that doesn't serve me. You know, that's not for me. Yeah, what I've act I've noticed is I've just been gradually detoxing myself off things. So when you do too big a fit jump from a change, it can it can just be too much for you. So just little things like, that I was doing previously, which you just do a bit less of and a bit less of and a bit less of, and then I go, okay, I'm not just going to do this like I was doing before, and then you drop something else off and then you allow yourself to sleep in a bit longer in the morning just to give yourself a good rest. And but just little things you notice if you can do that. And something I've got a very good friend who's a very good psychologist. I know that seeing you would know a lot about psychology is mental health. He says people don't trust their body enough yeah. and just allow themselves to rest and feel good. And he said, he actually said to me, he used to be very driven. And he said he's been in the best state of his life ever. Since he just says, you know what? Some days I wake up and think, you know what? I don't want to get out of bed yet. So he starts staying in bed till 8, 8.30. And yeah. he says, and I, and I, and yeah. I enjoy it. Some days I'm up at 5 in the morning and I'm off walking and working. Yeah. But what do we have in the Western world, right? We've got this hustle society, right? Where we're always just a hustle, 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 hustle. It's like this hustle mentality that we have. So we're always working to the clock. And exactly what you say around about you know, trying to break old habits will, you know, behaviors become habits, right? And so a lot of it just is in our subconscious. So we do things subconsciously because they've just become habits after we've had them as behavior for so long. So we need to substitute that stuff too, right, Was So, you know, if mobile phones are those things that we that people do of an evening, well, substitute that for meditation, you know, substitute that for, um, you know, spending time reading a book with family or kids or, you know, even having a phone call and a conversation with somebody because we, we have to replace because it, it creates a void. And if we have the void, then we fall back into old habits, right? So we've got to make sure that we're moving forward. It's just like a bicycle. It's got to continue to go forward, right? We've got to be always doing something, but we've got to be mindful of what it is that we're doing and what effect that actually has on us short-term and absolutely long-term as well. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Well, so much of it's in the subconscious, mate. Like everybody operates in their subconscious effectively. Um, you know, even now, like anxiety is you know, forward thinking, right? And depression has been stuck in the past from things that are happening in the past. So if we're on either side of those spectrums there, then we're not even in the present moment, yeah? And that's where we need to be is we need to be in that present moment because that's when we can make these changes. We can adjust. We're, we're conscious in that state, right? So it's important for us to get out of those subconscious habits and behaviors and make more conscious choices to start with and then allow those conscious choices to then become our new behaviors and habits. Yeah, I find one of the most interesting things I've been experimenting a lot with lately, based on what a very good psychologist friend told me, is a lot of focus on the breath. Yeah. Where even throughout the day, if I'm driving, I just really allow my breathing to be very rhythmic and very regulated. So like I'll breathe in, briefly pause, and then breathe out. And I just... I would say half the day now, I'm just focusing on my breath. And so when I start feeling what is very interesting, and I've never forgotten what an ancient master said to me, who's one of the most peaceful guys you'll ever meet, Trent. He was a Taoist Qigong master who knew Kung Fu. And he used, to, he used to say to me, oh, you must meditate, you know, and just rest. I said, but when I start breathing a lot, I said all kinds of anger and panic and grief come up. What do I do about that? He goes, oh, it will pass. It will pass. <laughs> Yeah, well, this too shall pass, right? 
Yeah, he just says, it will pass. And I said, but it just keeps happening. It passes, then it comes back. He goes, oh, that's life. <laughs> Until you pass. <laughs> yes, he said, it will keep coming and pass, keep coming and pass. <laughs> Well, we're, we're, we're a bit like that. We're a society now yeah. that doesn't really know how to be alone, you know, and the matrix pushes that tells us not to be lonely, but being alone and being lonely are two very different things, right? And it's in those moments when we're alone when we can reflect and we can deal with things. So, you know, quite often if we stop and we sit and a heap of things come at us, well, we obviously haven't given it the adequate time leading into to be able to process some of these things. And um, going on what you're saying with your breath there as well too was like, it takes about five and a half seconds for us to get all the oxygen to the whole body, right? And as we've evolved, we've lost that. Like you think about how much we, how short we breathe in now and then how quick we sort of breathe out. It's very, very, very short. Um, you know, prana breath work is fantastic in getting the balance from the left and the right side again. And I think it's one of the most valuable tools that anybody can be doing every day is making sure that their breath is in flow and it's in sync, making sure that it's got good rhythm, right? Because we need to be that rhythm. Yeah, if our breath is short and huffy and puffy, well, that's the vibration that we're putting out. So that's what we're going to see in our reality too. Where if we can slow our breath down and be in control of that breath, well, we're going to see that we're going to find, you know, harmony in, in our reality, right? Yes. What's very interesting though, is when you start making good choices, you often get a, all hell break loose because you're so used to living in a different, you know what I mean, don't you? Like I, yeah. I years for many years, I used to have this bit of a sunken chest and it was, I can remember my psychologist saying to me, you know, and yeah, I see one relatively regularly just to keep in good mental health. It's it. Cause to me, That's maintenance, goes, right? maintenance. Yeah, maintenance. Yeah. And he just yeah. said to me the other day, he goes to me, what's interesting for you now, as he said, your chest is completely open now. So he said like, there's not an, any stooping at all. So he said, which means you're pretty much processing all the time. He said, no yeah. doubt you, you, you're you dealing with more stuff these days than you were before. And I said, oh, yeah. He said, yeah, because he said, when your chest caves in, it's a way of self-protection. He said, yeah. where's you? So he said, one of the best things I he, he would teach people to do is when they're doing their breathing to get their chest open, really open up and practice opening up and breathing into it and feeling everything. Because he said, that will fast track the processing and you know, and I think processing is so important in being sovereign, not being afraid to face your emotions and being afraid to face what you're feeling. And like you said, making difficult choices to handle difficult situations. Yeah, you have to, mate. You have to. And it, going back on that breath just there, because you make a really good point there when you're talking about your chest. You think around about how we operate these days. We're so front forward, you know. A big part yeah. of our health is going to be our nervous system, right, and the structure of what that nervous system looks like. When we're hunched over and we're leaning forward, it's, it's like we close off our nervous system. So we've got so many challenges around us, but, you know, simple little things that we can do, even working on stretching the body and opening the body up and counterbalancing things like that can be fantastic for our health as well. But breath is super important, but we need to be mindful as we are evolving as a society with technology, well, we are becoming very damaged in that space. And we need to make sure that we counterbalance the damage that the requirements of this technological world that we live in you know this all day this all day this all day we're so front heavy right so we need to counterbalance that and uh you know really right what's the ultimate to sovereignty well you know it's 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 health really right because if we're not healthy then how can we enjoy any other part of what sovereignty might be for us and we want to be able to be our own physician we want to be our own doctors we want to make sure that we know our body we want to we want to know how our body works we want to be in tune with our body so then we can identify things as they arise before they even happen you know when we start to slide on that continuum towards you know poor health or, or starting to slide this way we want to make sure that we know ourselves know our body so we can catch it and we can bring ourselves straight back up right we never want things to, to slide too far so yeah we absolutely have to be aware of, the, of our body you know and as you know body holds holds everything yeah health is wealth you know i'm i, I mean I, I, some i have a few people say to me like why do you see so many different people like psychologists and chiros and physios i'm like well you look at lebron james look at athletes i said how many of them were constantly staying on top of it i said if i can stay in strong body strong mind nervous system well um through my breathing through regular stuff I said I'll be in better performance, and it's true, you know? Well, it's it's loving yourself, bro, right? Like, at the end of the day, right? When you respect yourself, 
and you invest in yourself and you invest in the, all the different holistic health practitioners that you work with, well, you're showing love to yourself first and foremost. Um, like you're showing that. value to yourself, bro. So if you can start to love yourself, well, the rest of the world can love you as well too, right? And then you start to operate, you know, on the vibration of love. And that's really where all the beauty happens. But we've got to take care of ourselves. You know, like Australia is mind blowing. Australia has got more pain than anywhere else, but we have this ridiculous pain threshold where we've become, pain has become normal for us now, for Australians, right? So many challenges. Australians are really great with this, that we just live with pain. We don't, we don't even really acknowledge it too much any longer. And, you know, I came across this the last couple of years when we talk around about the cannabis space, just how many people just put up with some challenges that they've got within their body because it's just become the normal. But no, we've got to put that work in. And, you know, when you see different people, it doesn't matter what area of life, but in regards to health, well, you're getting different perspectives to help understand yourself, right? So you're getting some outside point of view. So I think it's uh, I think it's super important, mate. Like I regularly once a week will at least get a massage once a week. There's always the Cairo. There's other little bits and pieces. But it's not so much for the end result that I'm after. It's more that I'm showing love to myself because I'm worthy like and, I, and, and I need to value myself, right? And yeah. Yeah, it's super important, man. So important, right? So important. No, I like that. Keep taking care of... That's actually a really good way of putting it, taking care of yourself, like loving yourself, nurturing yourself, being gentle with yourself, yep. being kind to yourself, comforting yourself a little bit when you need to comfort yourself. And we're not very good at that in this society. Oh, mate, we are absolutely terrible, bro. But, you know, we have to have that responsibility within ourselves too, right? But society most certainly teaches, like in the mental health space, mate, this is why I do my own programs, was everything in the mental health space is how to look after somebody else. Now, that's great. I'm all about that. I'm all about that. But if you're not looking after yourself, then how can you look after somebody else, right? So we're, again, same like religion, right? We've taken the focus outside when we need to bring the focus back to the inside, so we need to make sure that we look after ourselves as that number one priority before we can really invest any of that energy into anybody else, right? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Mm. Yeah, taking good care of yourself and just, um, yeah, because we don't do very well in society with that, do we? Like I was actually, I remember last year I was chatting with when I was, when my partner died and I went through a bit of a long grief process, as you know about, and um I can remember something that my psychologist actually said to me. He goes, the sad, he said, the shame for you is you weren't in indigenous culture. I said, why is that? He goes, they would just tell you, go and melt down and scream and cry and fresh until you got it all out of your nervous system. So they said they would wail, they would scream, they would go crazy for a few weeks. You know, they, they would mourn, they would wail, they would beat their breasts, they would thrash the ground, yep. they would scream from the depth of their soul with sorrow. Whereas they said, we're taught to hold it in, look strong and all that. And in the end, I ended up doing that, going to a course that helped me scream and release and let go of a lot of stuff and made a big difference. Yeah, man, I actually just caught up with some friends today that just came back from Darwin two days ago. And uh, they're up there visiting some other people, but there was two deaths in the indigenous community up there. So everything yeah. shut up for seven days. And I absolutely applaud that because we need to allow grief to process. But in this world we live in in the matrix where the big wheel keeps on turning, nobody gets the chance to process that grief. Like something like the example you just gave when we lose a loved one. You know, grief can be losing a job. You know, it might be a breakup in a relationship. The dog might die. Like there's many, many, many levels of what grief looks like or what trauma looks like because we all have a different perspective to that. But we've got to allow the time and we've got to clear it. Like I, I'm, I'm a huge believer in that. Like somatic healing, clearing it, yelling it, screaming it, move it all out. Because otherwise it sits within us. And if it sits within us, then it can start to take over, right? So we need to do that. But as a society, mate, we are absolutely shithouse at how we deal with that, how we deal with grief. Because again, the big wheel just keeps on turning. And that's what it's all about, keeping that big wheel turning, right? And that's where a lot of, you know, why do, why do we have so much, uh, not just within Australia, but everywhere, like so much to do with addiction. Like, you know, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is, you know, being connected. But we're just so so disconnected from ourselves, let alone society, right? You know, it's interesting you say that about connection. I've been learning that more and more myself and realizing how I held back from that at times. And I caught up with a friend last night. And I remember normally I wouldn't be like this, but I was just so happy to see her because she's just someone I haven't seen for about nine months. I 
love her to bits. We have a really good friendship and connection. Um, and I just, I think I just sat down, had my arm around her. I kept kissing her on the side and she just kept giggling and going, oh, and, and it wasn't like romantic or anything. I was just like, I'm just so happy to see you. It's just so good to connect. And then we were chatting and really connected and spent about an hour together. And it was all we spent and I left. And I remember feeling really good. Just think this is great, you know, just really connecting. And yeah, well, allowing it's, 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 open. it's authentic connection, right? And that connection yeah. when it's authentic is because it's coming from the heart. It's not coming from the head, which takes me yeah. back to my point around sovereignty. Sovereignty starts in the head because if you're stuck in their head, then you can never be sovereign. <laughs> Not possible. It is not possible. You need to be able to move from your head into your heart, right? So you need to be able to gain control of that consciousness. You need to be able to, to know, you know, the dark shadows within yourself and befriend those ones and work on the things that you need to and accept certain things, right? But, you know, for us, to, using your example there, mate, connection comes from the heart, yeah? That's where it all comes from. But it's impossible. And sometimes, you know, I've been in this position many times in my life where, I found it really difficult to connect and connection is really what we all crave, right? But I found it difficult to connect. So it's just in my head too much, yeah? Trying to work things out myself, trying to strategize things in myself, not trusting the process, not trusting myself, um, thinking about what I should be doing, what society wants me to do, how I should be doing things for other people. But when you can really bring that back to yourself, well, that's where all your connection comes from. And then through connection, we find joy, right? We find happiness, just as you described just there. Yeah. 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 It's like when you came for the cities event in about four months ago and just you, me, Josh and Will and the others hung out and just noticed, I think we all felt pretty fulfilled that whole trip, didn't we really? Just because we're connecting, we're spending time together. We're out in the, in the bush. We're away from the matrix. We're teaching. And I think something like that, especially when we talk about secret of the cities, like, uh, you know, it's difficult for us to have those conversations, you know, not just, not just in the public, but even in, you know, close friend networks right but when you get to be around people that are on that same wavelength that are really within their authentic self and it's something that they desire to know about that they're, they're interested in well you naturally open up your heart yeah think about it like when you're at school school's probably not the best example but like when you're in a classroom with a, a topic or a teacher that you don't like is it going to go anywhere <laughs> you know Versus when you're in the classroom with a, a teacher or a topic that you like, that you really get involved, you really open right up to it, yeah? Because you're operating from that authentic self, you know, you're operating from your heart. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Well, maybe tell us a bit about the Sovereign Purpose Plan, Trent. Just give, And while you're doing that, you just start talking. It'll be 30 seconds, but keep talking. Yeah, go for it, mate. Um, so sovereign purpose plan, we've just finished the sovereign purpose plan last night, which went for eight weeks. So the sovereign purpose plan runs for two hours a week over an eight week period. Uh, there's one which is coming up on August 20th and probably a good way to think of the sovereign purpose plan would be, I'll use Warren as an example, but if you think of Warren's level of sovereignty, his level of knowledge, his understanding, and then you think about an entry level novice who's someone who maybe has just recently woken up. They've been trying to find avenues to get outside of this matrix. They're looking for ways to, to move forward, but some of the jargon can be a little bit too heavy and it might be too hard to understand. So I really bridge the gap in the sovereign purpose plan. And I like to do things in a, using analogies and I like to do things in like a, a linear timeline because we really need to understand things in a bit of a linear timeline to be able to, to get the full grasp and this perspective. So throughout the eight weeks, uh, each week there's, you know, two or three different topics, everything from rewiring your subconscious to the strawman, to law versus legal, to cryptocurrencies, uh, to money creation, religion, manifestation, the sovereign entrepreneur and a bunch of other little bits and pieces in between. But the key to the sovereign purpose plan is the rewiring of the subconscious. That's the key to what the sovereign purpose plan is. So the sovereign purpose plan is around about how to be mentally free and how to be sovereign within the mind. But it's impossible to do that if you keep being the person that you are now. You have to create the person that you're coming into in that sovereign. You need to put the plan in play to do that. And above anything, you, you need to brainwash yourself back into belief. Um, and that's the biggest challenge with sovereignty, right? Is it's, it, it all comes down to having strong belief within yourself. You've got to have that belief. But we've all got such limiting beliefs because that's what the matrix has put around us in every way, shape or form, more and more than ever. 
So throughout the purpose plan, I teach a couple of little different, you know, d- different little things around about how to navigate through that stuff, uh, how to block out those spirit snipers. Um, and, you know, the outcome of that purpose plan is to give people the education, fill the gray area so they can have conversations like this up here, uh, create some desire, but above anything to have a template that you, that people can utilize now, but not only just now, they can continue to use that template for the rest of their life. And that template would change because their purpose will change. And through that process of building that template, uh, most people, when I say most, I'm pretty confident to say everybody will really, will really come into their heart. They'll get out of their head and they'll come into their heart and they'll find, or they'll reconnect with what that real purpose of theirs is. And then once we've finished the purpose plan, there's uh, multiple avenues and multiple opportunities. There's one thing called the blueprint, which is how you physically become free. Uh, there's IM memberships moving forward, which is up-to-date tools, tips, skills to work within that sovereignty space as well. Because uh, similar to you know what you were saying before, Warren, about your health, like maintenance is everything. We can't just think that, oh, okay, I want to be sovereign. Okay, I'm sovereign and that's it. Like, it doesn't work. <laughs> Again, it's something which has got to be maintained. Again, and we've got to continue to do that work. So sovereign purpose plan, get the education in a 101 and have the ability and the tools to be able to rewire your own subconscious. But but with that said, Warren, we do the lessons, we give the tools, but again, it comes down to responsibility. So the, you know, the people that are in the purpose plan, they've got everything in front of them by this point after the eight weeks, but it still comes down to their responsibility to, to drive it forward, right? Yeah. yeah. No, what I liked about doing it myself and just seeing what you're doing, the way you cover a bit of everything, because most sovereignty things tend to be extreme on one things. Whereas the truth is sovereignty is about guiding people in their own journey to find their, to find a balance. And even today, you know, I was chatting with someone about this, you know, how you go through various stages in life. And I mean, you know, there are various diets and, you know, that are out there. Like some says you should go carnivore and someone else says you should go keto and someone else says you should do this. And the truth is I've noticed a bit like the seasons of the earth, things tend to change in the different cycles you're in. Like, you know, I ate the worst diet on planet Earth, I think, until I was about 25. In fact, I was telling William about it. I said, I used to go to Hungry Jack's, and you'll love this, Trent. I would order a Whopper double beef with cheese, no salad, um, lots of tomato sauce, double double chocolate fudge sundae, large Coke. And mm. I wouldn't have any salad. I avoided water like the plague, and I wondered why I had acne and all kinds of stuff going on. And then I remembered when I... And then I remembered when I went got very sick, um in the end and i ended up going on this kind of diet where i went a lot more stricter in my diet for a while i mean i even went very keto for a while and all kinds of then i went vegan then i it went into periods of intense fasting and and all, all of them helped me a lot in my journey and, and in the end i've just these days i'm more tend to listen to my body you know i go through periods like as a sovereign man of my body i have periods where like i've just, I've just been eating a lot lately i felt i've needed to eat a lot and but not for breakfast. I've been eating big lunches and big dinners and very small breakfasts. And yeah. and I've been led to drink a lot of water the last few days. So I'm drinking like twice as much my normal water intake. So you just learn to trust your body in the end, don't you? Well, you do, mate. And it's really interesting how you say that, right? Because I, um, <laughs> another part of my life is that uh, I'd spent uh, 14 to 15 years as a personal trainer just on the side. And uh, I live around the Byron Bay area. And, you know, towards the back end of my era in that space, like, all the celebrities that come to Byron Bay is who I would train. So I'd work with a lot of high profile people. And a lot of these high profile, high profile people would have such strict resumes, right? Now, if you're a sovereign, you don't like rules. <laughs> so why do we have an all or nothing approach to our diet if we're a sovereign as well too, right? It's around about being in tune with our body and listening to our body and knowing what it needs when it needs it. Yeah. And having that brain connection, you know, the brain to heart connection, the head to body connection. Because that's 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 vital that we have to have that. We've got to listen to it because every moment is different. But we do. We have this attitude of the all or nothing approach. And you know, what's the I hate the word diet, to be honest with you, man. I absolutely hate it. But it's, you know, what what's what's the you know, what's the best uh, um the best, you know, nutrition plan for one? Well, the one that works for them. It's that simple. There is no one size fits all. Like, it, oh man, it's sent me crazy for a long time. All this no carbs, high protein. If you're someone built like me and you, Warren, you know, with long arms, long limbs, the the, the ectomorph body type, well, we need sixty percent carbs. If we do not have carbs, then we cannot operate. So, having a no carb diet for someone like us is never going to work. It's going to cause problems. 
That is the most interesting thing you said just about anything today because I, I hear all that stuff and I have discovered that these days I eat a lot more carbs. Like I've got a very good naturopath who's very switched on and he even said to me, he goes, you actually, he said in your case, he said word for word what you said. He said, you need a lot of carbs because you have a lot of energies and a very active mind. So he said, he said, don't listen to people, for example, tell you that fries aren't good for you because fries is just potatoes. It's all they are. He said, if yeah. you want to go and eat fries most days of the week it's honestly not an issue he said um he said just don't listen to what people tell you about that he said carbs works for your body a lot better he goes i can assure yeah. you he said just every now and again you'll find you'll go off them a little bit yeah. um and you know and just have to back off like anything you'll need to rest every now and again and do a bit of intermittent fasting but you you said just trust your body it will tell you when to do it yeah, mate. I'll I, um I'll tell you a couple of things here because I think I think this will be quite valuable for the people on the other end, right? Let me dip into the personal train a bit for a minute because it will yeah, assist yeah. them to be sovereign within their body, right? So, you the best format that I can give everyone here at the moment and to anybody is a general consensus. Okay, is there's two things that you need to know. The first thing that you need to know is there's three different body types. Now these body types are built on the structure of your body on the bone structure of your body okay so your three different body types that you have is you have an ectomorph so an ectomorph doesn't have wide shoulders doesn't have wide hips got you know no ass type of person right but really long limbs so that's your ectomorph then you've got your endomorph and quite often people view or people think usually within themselves that the endomorph is is, is the fat stocky person but it's not, it's the strong person. So it's wider shoulders, wider hips, not so long within the limbs. And then you've got your mesomorph and your mesomorph is like your natural athlete. Yeah, just that natural athlete that really struggles to put body fat always chiseled. So within those three, ectomorph, endomorph, and mesomorph, within those three, there is a general census of macronutrients as a good guy. But first, let me tell you about macronutrients. So macronutrients, there's only four. There's fats, there's proteins, there's carbohydrates, and then there's alcohol, okay? Those four are macronutrients. Now, whenever we put things into our mouth, we break them down, they chew, they go down the esophagus, making their way to the stomach, and they go through the intestines. And your intestines, think of it like a hose at the moment. So this, my fist is like the intestines. It's pumping. So it's like a second mouth breaking things down. But you've got these things called villi, which are like vacuums on the inside, and they absorb the macronutrients, and that's what your metabolism is. So when the villi is absorbed, the macronutrients, that's when your metabolism comes to life, and it converts the solid, and it converts it into energy, right? So they're the only four things. So a good way to think of macronutrients is carbohydrates is for energy, protein is for muscle, and fat is for your mental health. Now, alcohol's got no purpose whatsoever. It's completely dead. But within your body, if you have alcohol within your system, then your villi will go for the alcohol before they touch any other macronutrient. And we know that it takes, you know, one hour for 0.05 of alcohol to be absorbed or one standard drink, 10 grams of alcohol. So alcohol really is the devil in that space. But to give everybody a simple understanding without going on a tangent too much here, if you're an ectomorph and an ectomorph, again, long limbs, short shoulders, short hips, an ectomorph would be 55, at least 55% carbohydrates, 25% protein, and 20% fats. Now, if you're the end, if you were the endomorph, quite wide shoulders, wide hips, quite strong, well, 40% of your diet should be fat. And most of the time, people think that they're fat when they have these body types, so they stay away from fat. Sugar makes us fat, not fat, good fats. So you would have 40% fats and then you would have 30% carbohydrates and then you would have 30% uh, of protein would be for the endomorph. And then when you talk about the mesomorph, which is the natural athlete, well, then you're talking around about 40% into 40% uh, into protein. And then you're talking around about 30% on either side of carbohydrates and fat. Oh my God. Yeah, because I'm definitely an ectomorph from what you've said. Oh yeah, absolutely you are, mate. Absolutely you are. You're quite tall, you know. You that don't makes really sense because I love carbs. I like really good bread. I like I like potatoes and rice. Um, oh. and I love and fats. Yeah, I love I love cheese and oh. I like bacon. And I always yep. like to eat fat on my bacon. And yeah, yeah I love cheese. Whereas I, I don't like avocado. Just I don't. I can only have very small doses. But yeah, I love lots of cheeses and coconuts uh -huh. and that kind of stuff. And yeah, fishes, nuts, you know, all that. Kangaroo meat, yeah. 
Yeah, so that's important. Let's just touch on that for a moment, was because I think it's really important because in the society that we live in now, yes. uh, especially the supermarket as an example, you know, we see things in a supermarket that says 99% fat free. Well, it's really telling us it's 99% sugar, right? So there's so much marketing behind it. But what we need to be what we need to be really mindful of is to know that our brain is fat. It's what it is. So fat fuels fat. So if we're having poor mental health, when we need to look at our diet, we need to ensure that we're getting good fats into our diet, all the things that you just, just described just there. And that's a one thing that we miss, mate, massively miss. I see it all the time. Saturated fats might get ate, but not your good fats, right? So mental health, again, fats is what it is for your brain, your clarity. MCT oil is a great thing, was I know you use MCT or coconut oil. Um, it's really, really good. And we should all really be utilizing that every day, um, take an MCT oil. So then we can actually activate the brain, you know, allow the brain to feel, you know, it's a good word, hydrated effectively so it can operate. But yeah, MCT oil, fantastic. 10 bucks at the local shop, you know, a little shot of that every morning is incredible for mental health. Yeah, right. Yeah. Goodness me, how interesting. No, so it's all these little things that you just don't realize, eh? It's all the one percenters, brother. It's all the one percenters that matter, right? Yeah. It's always the one percenters that matter. Yeah. Well, so really from here, in moving to conclude, it's been really interesting. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, we're going to be running our sovereignty event, which is going to be happening on 20th of July. Before I go into that, maybe just share a bit more about your sovereign purpose, final comments on that, because obviously we're going to be sharing more about that and promoting it directly when we run the 20th of July event, which I'll be sharing more about shortly. But maybe you share any final comments about that and, and how it's helped people. Uh, well, after waking up this morning, so I just had a, a group go through the last eight weeks. I shouldn't say group, they're my tribe, right? They're not a group, they're my tribe. Uh, and they've just gone through the last eight weeks and waking up this morning um, or throughout the day, you know, I've had 20, I think it's 24 or 25 testimonials come through just in the last, since we finished last night. So I'm still yet to see the full scope of how it looks for everybody on the other end. Um, I'm still yet to see the scope of what their purpose plan might look like and, and then what their next step in their journey might be. But the, I know the purpose plan works because it works, it works for many, many, it's worked for many, many people, right? And a big part of it is just, yes, the education, people waking people up to the matrix, given the, the education, but it's also people are investing in themselves, similar to when you talk about your health, that they're allocating the time to think about purpose <laughs> and allocating time to think around about what it is and realize how far they've gotten away from what that true purpose that they desired when they were younger or that little desire that they have in the back of their mind. So um, I think it's, I think it's going to work incredible for the group that's just gone through now. Uh, again, it's, it's one of those things where I walk with people. Um, I don't carry anyone. It's a 50, 50 people have to put their effort in as well too, but you can really define and you can really understand what sovereignty is very, very quickly in an eight week space. And a lot of the tools that I believe that we, that, that we teach and that we share, they're tools that people have for the rest of their lives that they can then branch further off from that. And, uh, and one thing outside of that purpose plan that we got coming up in a couple of months or next month probably is, you know, having a membership around it where there's one thing each week, which is a tool around how to maintain and navigate that sovereignty. And like, I'm so passionate at the moment around about using technology to help sovereignty because it's worked incredible for me in the last couple of years. Um, it creates more time. And I think that's a bit of a thing that you get in the sovereign purpose plan as well is you see a different perspective and you see you, you hear different ideas that may align with what your purpose could be or, or creating what that purpose is. Because, mate, the opportunity is fantastic. There's no better time to, to be sovereign than right now. I think that there's going to be a, a big, in my belief, I think there's about 18-month window to be able to do some stuff. And I think it's going to be really, really, really challenging for people to enter that sovereign space with the current landscape that we have. So final note for me on that one was, is that I am sovereign. The sovereign purpose plan to me is my purpose. It's my way to give back to people. It's my way to share my knowledge from all the extensive knowledge from industries and places I have. And I feel it's my duty to share it because I feel we're in a time where that window is, is closing, you know, quite quickly. And uh, I've made the commitment to do that until 2026 
And um, as I told the guys last night, you'll, you know, you'll find me sailing off into the sunset in 2026. Uh, but between now and then, it's it's my duty to serve and to help those find sovereignty whilst whilst we can. And I don't mean to say that in a fearful way. It's just the reality, right? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I do actually agree. I've been saying it for years. But I think we're definitely on the on the on the kind of declining into the clock. You know, in terms of timing to be sovereign, where there's a train going to the new world order, and basically. And being caught right in the worst of it and you're either going to be on it or you're going to be off it and is and there's not really much time now to, to be out of it you know and covid certainly woke a lot of people up to make people realize the need to take action and i think that we are definitely heading for a covid phase two um yep. it's not a question of if it's when and it's just yeah not being afraid of it just being sovereign and being prepared and and sovereignty isn't comfortable i mean i know you'd agree with me on that one Trent. it's far from comfortable sovereign means that you've got a make some decisions sometimes you've got to take responsibility you've got to feel some pain and deal with some stuff that could easily just be avoided by not being sovereign you know and many people in the vaccine in covid the easiest thing to do was just comply whereas those yeah. who didn't comply was very difficult you know yeah. well let me tell you a story here so these are stories i don't really share very often but let me tell you what it's like in prison when you're stuck within walls and you have no other choice but to follow the rules, you are thrown with authority. You're absolutely petrified for your life the whole time that you're within there. You're very mindful of what you do. I've got through my years in there through, you can have my body, but you'll never take my soul. So a big part of the, the mindset that I have is I learned how to have that mindset in a space where I was confined and I could not move. And that's going to be the real reality check on this next lockdown because I agree with how we started this conversation was there is going to be lockdowns. There are going to be different lockdowns. I believe these lockdowns will be area lockdowns. I believe that you'll find the CBDCs coming within here. I'll find, I believe that you'll find that people utilizing CBDC will not be able to spend their currency, their CBDC currency outside their local region. It'll be programmed within that. And this is another big reason why I believe these 18 months are every, really these next six months. And I believe that you would agree with me because we have got something which has never happened. The whole wealth is changing in the next six to 18 months, all of it. Everything, the whole analog system is over. It's all digital, not just the money that we utilize, but deeds, titles, everything is going to go on to this massive ledger. So we've got this opportunity right now for people that may people that may not really have uh not be in a position to be able to invest in some sovereignty stuff and move forward and whatever but we have got the greatest wealth opportunity through cryptocurrency right now like absolutely mind-blowing if you get your on-ramp but more importantly your off-ramp right there's generational wealth for sovereign families throughout your bloodline it's huge but people don't understand it i don't think no, look, I love it, Trent. Now, we've got about three or four more minutes before our next um, podcast of Nick Cree, who, of course, is the a very exciting. And you, I mean, you're there with Nick. Nick is the true badass sovereign individual who I, I love his approach. The peaceful way you question everything, governments, everyone. And, yeah, That's Nick, awesome. like I said, he was a bit of a mentor for many of us in the sovereign movement years ago, like when I was involved 20, 25 years ago. So reconnecting with him has been very exciting for me, and he's very keen to be part of what we're all doing. And um, yeah, if you think you've learned stuff from me, you'll learn some next level stuff from Nick, um, Trent. So um, hey, I'm it's always good, but always a, forever a student, right? Forever a student. Yeah. So I'm just going to quickly share about our sovereignty event we're doing in July um, for everyone. So on the, as you know, Global Wealth Club, we regularly do these kind of events just to kind of these one day events, just to give back to members and just to be available. Of course, it's um, free for the Ignite and members and that, and those who aren't members, it's just um, we've got an early bird special on right now, which is uh, 127 for our early bird right now. Um, but basically, you're going to see Trent there giving about the sovereign stuff and sharing more about creating your own sovereign purpose, giving you a little bit of a introduction and then, you know, making but those of you who want to continue learning with him, he does run his own independent course outside of us, which um, in the I Am Sovereign movement. Nick's, got, Nick's agreed to speak on income sovereignty and knowing your lawful rights and becoming a big sovereign entrepreneur. So following that scheme and how to, you know, exercise your lawful rights outside the matrix, but yet still function within the matrix as an entrepreneur. So, I mean, you, and you're learning from someone who really is a, a Jason Bourne badass, you know, who's gone in the courts and directly challenged them and in a 
peaceful way. I got you know, got me speaking. You know, I sound boring in comparison now, but I'll be speaking on a lot about the keynote address about your sovereignty, about the times that we're in. I'm sharing my insights as to where I see things are heading. And for whatever reason, I do tend to get pretty good insight into where things are heading and the timings. It's just something that I tend to get pretty well to be sharing about that for my background as a lawyer, accountant and planner, and um, as well as being in underground movements and all kinds of crazy things. I mean, Stephen Pettit, I've asked to speak about, you know, getting a sovereign plan B for those of you who want that backup. But if Australia really does lose the plot and you realise you just don't want to be here anymore and there's lots of people doing that, one of my business partners has done that now. She's gone to Bali. She just said, no, nah, can't handle this anymore. And I've certainly got my little plan B in the back of my mind um, on that. So Steve will be sharing a little bit more on that. So it's going to be happening on the Saturday, the 20th of July online. Just type a Y in the text chat if you're definitely interested or planning to come. I've already had a few message me about it. Just kind of say if you're keen to come along and get some more education on sovereignty and be part of that event. Yep, a few people. Definitely don't want to miss this. So what we'll do is just put the, the, the link to register in there. Um, so you can jump on there and basically register your interest. And like I said, if you're already a, you know, secure your wealth or VIP member, you just send us an email is what we've got here. So if you're already a member of the Global Wealth Club and we will enroll you, otherwise here's a link for you to sign up and be part of it. But Trent, thank you so much for coming and we really appreciate it, my friend. Um, appreciate your time. Always welcome, mate. Always welcome. Uh, enjoy the conversation with Nick. I will. See you, my friend. Thanks, guys. Bye. I appreciate you all. Have a great evening. Bye.